Amen and amen. I'm gonna take one more swig of this. This will be a long ride. <laughs> I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Just by show of hands, how many of you are familiar with this particular verse of scripture? Well, if you've ever been to a funeral, unfortunately, you've you've heard this particular scripture many times. It's interesting because we often hear this particular scripture at funerals. It's, it's, it's a way of putting an exclamation point on the life of the person that we are eulogizing. We, we want people to remember the fact that they fought a good fight, that they finished their race. And God knows if they're a believer, we want you to know that they've kept the faith. We always hear this verse of scripture at funerals. And as I began to read it, I know some of y'all got nervous. Y'all like, who in the world are we eulogizing today? And I want to put you at ease this morning. We're not eulogizing anybody. What was interesting about this text is that Paul is writing to his son in the gospel. He's writing to Timothy. Now, this is his second letter. This is why we call it Second Timothy. The first letter, um, he's writing to encourage Timothy. Timothy is the pastor of the church at Ephesus, and, and he's trying to let him know, you know, things are going to be okay, that you can do this. Don't let anybody despise your youth. I know you're young. I felt that thing when Paul wrote it as a young pastor myself. <laughs> but 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 don't let folks push you around. Don't, don't let folks just walk all over you. Yeah. You can do this thing. Stir up the gift inside of you. He, he's, he's encouraging this pastor. But, but when he gets to the second letter, it's a little different because Timothy's been pastoring for a little bit. And many scholars believe that word had gotten to Paul, who's now no longer under house arrest. He's in real jail. And this is the last time Paul is going to be writing anything. He's heard that his son in the gospel is getting weary in well doing. And so the first time he was encouraging him to go forth in ministry. But now he's trying to convince his son that that it's worth fighting for, that don't, don't throw in the towel. I know that persecution is picking up. I know it seems like the world is going crazy. I know it seems like the saints ain't paying you no mind. I know things are getting rough for you as a pastor. I know that every time you step in the pulpit, your life is on the line because the emperor Nero was ruling over the land in that time. I know things are difficult, my son, but I'm writing to you from a jail cell, not knowing if I'm gonna make it out of here, if, if I'm gonna walk out of this cell or if I'm going to die here beheaded by Nero, but I'm writing to let you know that I would not change a thing. And even though I'm, I'm possibly getting to the end of my life, I want you to know that it's worth it. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. And he takes the last part of this letter to, as we like to say, look back over his life. <laughs> See, we always tell you to look back over your life because we want you to find reasons to give God praise. But 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 Paul is looking back over his life as he's writing this last will and testament to his son in the gospel to let him know, listen, as I look back over my life, certainly I have many reasons to give God praise. But 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 I've come to the realization that as I look back over my life, I lived a good life. Yeah. Yeah. And I would argue that maybe we need to stop waiting for funerals to preach this text. Yeah. Yeah. To talk about what we think someone did yeah. and instead start preaching this text before funerals yeah. so it can become the thing that we're now doing. Because yeah. I believe that Paul, uh, as he's writing this letter, as he's referencing these three things, he's using them as a measuring stick to say my life was pretty good. Yeah. If I were to get today's sermon the title, it would simply be when I look back over my life, will you will, will, will you preach this thing to somebody? Will you tap your neighbor on the shoulder? Uh, 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 will you smile behind that mask at him? Make good eye contact with him and say, um, Pastor Mike came to tell you. Uh, uh, what do you see? When you look back over your life, when I look back over my life, the Apostle Paul is ending his letter to his son, Timothy, and he ends it with these words, Timothy, my son in the gospel. When I look back over my life, I can say that I fought the good fight. When I look back over my life, I, I can honestly say I finished the race. When I look back over my life, this is the part I shout about. I kept my faith. Yeah. When everything in the world told me to let it go, I kept my faith. Yeah. Yeah. When it seemed like I couldn't take another step, I kept my faith. Oh, when I thought I might just lose my mind, I kept my faith. Yeah. When I didn't know where my next meal was coming from, I yeah. kept my faith. Yeah. 
Uh, when I woke up and, and, and really, if I can be honest, I wondered, God, why did you wake me up? I kept my faith. When I look back over my life, somebody say, when I look back over my life, I, I want to share with you today. So good to see my sister on this morning. Uh, I want to share with you today, if you're taking notes, three questions to consider today for a better tomorrow. Three questions to consider today for a better tomorrow. Y'all, excuse me if y'all don't shout today, uh, uh, but three questions to consider today for a better tomorrow. The first thing, the first question I want you to consider, again, I, I pray that you're writing this down. Uh, if not, I'm sure they're taking care of me on Facebook right now. Uh, the first question you want to ask yourself when you look back over your life is, am I rumbling well? I'm going to give you three R's today. Am I rumbling well? Will you help your neighbor real quick? Say, neighbor, yeah. how's your rumbling going? How's your rumbling going? Uh, for those who don't know Ebonics, that's, that, that's just a cool way of saying fight. How, are, are you fighting well? That, am I rumbling well? Where am I getting this from? Well, this is the first thing that Paul reflects on in the text. He says, um, I have fought the good fight. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a word guy. I'm, I'm a word guy. Y'all know that. Y'all been with me long enough. I'm a word guy. And so I, my mind started going when I read that Paul says I fought the good fight. Paul, right. Paul didn't just say I fought the fight. Right. He, he said I fought the good fight, uh, which suggests to me that there's a such thing as a bad fight, <laughs> which now raises the question, what is the criteria for a good fight? Yeah. Y'all know me. I'm a word guy. And I believe in getting into the etymology of a thing in the original language of the text. And so I began to dig a little deep into this text because I had to understand, Paul, what in the world is a good fight? How do you know you fought a good fight? And, and when I looked this up in the Greek, it was the word kalos. Somebody say kalos. kalos. He said, I fought the kalos fight. Now, that word kalos means beautiful. <laughs> Paul said, I fought the beautiful fight. Now, some of y'all are confused because uh, you've been in a fight before. Yes, sir. And there's usually nothing beautiful about a fight. Amen. In fact, some of y'all lost some beauty in a fight because you walked out with some scars. You, you walked out with some blood on your face. Some of y'all look like Martin coming out of some of them fights. Uh, uh, it really ain't too much beautiful about a fight. But Paul says, I fought the Kalos. He, he chose this particular word. He said, I fought the beautiful fight. And, and so I'm now talking to the text because I'm like, God, I ain't really seen nothing too beautiful about a fight. He said, uh, 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 even though the fight may be ugly, there's something beautiful in it. Mm -hmm. Paul is not saying that he won all of his fights. Paul is not saying that he always had a flawless victory. Paul is not saying that he never walked out of these fights without some bruises and some scars. But what Paul is saying is that whenever I got in a fight, I got in a fight that I could find something beautiful in. Yeah. And I would argue that what's messing some of us up from living the life that God has called us to live is that we're just too committed to ugly fights. Yeah. Paul says, I fought the fight so that I could find something beautiful in. Paul says that when I went into a fight, I, I had to see some beauty in that thing. There had to be something on the other side of it beautiful, mm -hmm. which means that he was not just looking for something in it, but it also spoke to the effort that he gave. I gave a beautiful effort that, yeah. that when you see me fight, it's a thing of yeah. beauty. If you've ever seen yeah. Muhammad Ali fight, he used to say, I uh, float like a butterfly and I sting like a bee. He was light on his feet. He would do this little shuffle back and forth all across the ring. There was something beautiful about his fight. And, and I would say that there's something beautiful about your fight. I know things are ugly right now. I know things are atrocious. I know things are horrific, but, 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 but I dare you to find something beautiful in that fight because when I see some of you fight, ah, oh, it's a thing of beauty. It's something about watching a man whose children have been taken from him and he's paying child support, but he keeps fighting to see those babies. There's some beauty in that fight. There's something beautiful about my mama walking off her job one day and walking home because she wanted to teach me the lesson that there's no amount of money that's worth your respect, that you don't work a job and get disrespected. You walk off of that job and trust God for something better. There's something beautiful in that fight. There's something beautiful about that person that's taking care of their loved one who's fighting dementia and barely remembers them, but they show up every 
day to reintroduce themselves and to show them that I love you. That even though you treat me a certain way, I love you. Even though you don't remember all the good times, I love you. Even yeah, though yeah. I'm watching you fade away, I, there's something beautiful about that fight. There's something beautiful about that pastor that gets up every Sunday and he has an encouraging word for people, even though in the deep down to the tail of his soul, he's discouraged himself. That's a beautiful fight. That I, I want you to know that I know the fight may be ugly, but you got to find something beautiful in it. Yes, sir. Paul says, um, I'm sitting in a jail cell and I'm about to be beheaded. But when I look back over my life, I wouldn't change a thing because what's beautiful about what's about to happen when I leave this jail cell is that they're going to cut off my head. Ah, but Christ is going to get glory. <laughs> ah, that, that, that there's nothing they can do to me in this moment that won't end in beauty. Yeah. See, because uh, uh, Jesus said, if you suffer with me yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, and God knows my savior suffered. Yeah. And so I'm willing to suffer with him because I understand that. Watch this. After they cut off Paul's head, if you jump down to I want to say the eighth verse, Paul said there is a crown waiting for me <laughs> ah, that they could take my head, but they couldn't take my crown. Yeah. And there's something beautiful about that fight. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. But, but Kalos doesn't just mean beautiful. Kalos means worthy. <laughs> Paul said, um, when I look back over my life, I've had a good life. And I know I've had a good life because I fought the worthy fights. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to my first thought. Stop wasting good energy in bad fights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stop wasting good energy in bad fights. See, the problem with some of us, we're not living up to our full potential. We're not living in the life that God would have us to live is because we're exerting so much time, energy, and emotion into bad fights. The fights are not worth it. I would argue what makes a good fight, uh, uh, an actual good fight, is what you walk away with. Yes. And some of y'all have been fighting folks who have nothing to lose. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm to a place in my life that I'm not just fighting anybody. Matter of fact, let's take a poll. When the last time y'all seen Pastor Mike fighting here? Yeah, that, that's how specific I am. You got to get me to a certain level. Watch this. But I also have to see enough value in the fight right. because I will never get in a fight where I walk away empty handed. Right. Paul said what makes my life amazing is that I fought the fights that were worth it, that, that, that I never went into a fight where I walked out empty handed, right. that, that, that if I'm going to get in this fight, uh, I'm, I'm leaving with something. I'm not just leaving with scars. I'm not just leaving with a story. I'm not just leaving with hurt emotions. Uh, but if I go into this fight, I'm coming out of this fight with something. Watch this. I may not come out with the title winner, but I'm coming out with a win. Uh, if I'm going into a fight, I got to come out of it with something. Paul said I fought the worthy fight. I, that, that if I fought the fight, I had to come out of it with something. Uh, uh, there was this boxer who was at the top of his game. And uh, he had a, a really huge fight coming up. And uh, his, 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 his manager went and arranged everything for the fight. And the fighter was just in the gym getting ready. They kept interviewing him. Are you ready for the fight? He said, yeah, I'm ready for the fight. My manager's taking care of everything. I'm just making sure I'm at the top of my game. I'm ready for this fight. He goes into the fight, and uh, the, uh, the, the opponent wasn't really too well known. Now, he's the champion, and this other person ain't really too well known. And, and, and so the odds are, are, are really stacked against this new person. And so the champion goes into the fight. And uh, he holds his own for a little bit. But as the fight progresses, the champ starts going down and folks are getting worried. They're like, what in the world? What is happening? And finally, about the eighth round, this unknown fellow takes down the champion. They interview the champion afterwards and they say, champ, you had a good run. How do you feel? You, you, you took this loss from this nobody. And he said, well, he may have taken the belt, but I took the bag. I'm going to say that again. Uh, 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 I know I went down on the mat. I know it was pretty embarrassing, uh, but he walked away with a belt. I walked away with the bag. I got to school, y'all. Okay, so if you don't know nothing about boxing, let me tell you something I just found out. That before the two fighters go into the fight, 
their managers make negotiations and they call uh, they do something they call splitting the purse splitting the purse uh is where one fighter gets one percentage and the other fighter gets another percentage but it's usually never a 50 50 because one fighter is always more well known than the other fighter i've seen those purses split from as high as 80 20 uh, uh to about 45 35 uh, uh and so what he's saying is listen i know i took a dive I know I took a, I took one to the jaw that put me down, uh, but I'm walking away from this fight with more than he did. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, I'm trying to help somebody that, 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 that if you're going to live the life that God has called you to live, you got to make sure that when you're going into a fight, that it's a fight worth going into, that, that, that I'm not losing more when I go in this fight than I am. I, I once heard a, a famous rapper say this, a wise man told me don't argue with fools because people from a distance can't tell who is who some of y'all are arguing with folks who have nothing to lose and i've come to this conclusion the holy ghost revealed this to me during my time of study he says there are some enemies who come uh, uh to battle you or to fight you not because they're trying to actually get the win but they're coming to expose something in you Mm. <laughs> be careful about the fights that you take yeah. because there are some fights where people are not necessarily coming to be called a winner they're coming to show somebody else that there's a loser in you yeah. uh, and this is a season where you got to protect yourself that you cannot afford I know you are arrogant I know you're cocky I know no weapon formed against you can prosper but sometimes the weapon ain't trying to prosper it's just trying to put a dent in you yeah, yeah. Uh, am I rumbling well Am I choosing my enemies strategically? Again, I'm to a place where I, I'm, I'm not arguing with everybody. I'm not jumping into everything because I have to be walking away with something. There are some of us who have lost really good relationships because we fought to the point of not walking away with understanding, but we fought to the point that I couldn't stand you when I walked away. Look at your neighbor say, neighbor, neighbor. what you walking away with? And, and if you're not walking away with something, that fight ain't worth it. And as we reflect on the time that we're living in, what's the fight you want to be known for? One thing that keeps me humble, and I learned this from my bishop, uh, and, and, and you may call us extreme, but 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 there's some value to this wisdom. He says that he, he would never let the sun go down on his wrath, that that, that, that if he and his wife were having issues, that he would try to work it out before they went to bed. Because the truth of the matter is, if I don't wake up tomorrow, I don't want my last fight to have been a fight with you. I want my last fight to have been a fight for you. I, I, I want you to remember me that when I'm gone here, that Pastor Mike didn't leave this earth hurting my feelings. He didn't leave this earth uh, calling me out my name. He didn't leave this earth, or earth hurting my emotions. He didn't leave this earth making me feel insignificant. Uh, Ah, but when he left this earth, he was fighting for me. When he left this earth, he was encouraging me. When he left this earth, he made me feel like somebody. Yeah. Uh, what fight will you become famous for? Mm. Paul says, when I look back over my life, I can say I lived a good life because I rumbled well. Somebody say, I'm rumbling well. I'm rumbling well. Uh, uh, not only do you want to ask yourself, am I rumbling well? But, but, but you want to ask yourself, am I running a quality race? Mm -hmm. Am I running a quality race? Someone's like, I ain't ran in a long time, but are you running a quality race? Paul says, I have finished. Somebody say finish. Yeah. He says, I finished my race. Now, y'all, again, I'm a word guy. And so I'm, 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 I'm noticing something here. He, he didn't say I ran my race. He said, I finished my race. He didn't say I, I ran my race. He said, I finished my race. Now I'm, 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 I'm talking to the Holy Ghost here. I'm like, Holy Ghost, there's, there's something here. What, what are you trying to reveal? He said, uh, uh, look at that word finished. He, he said, I finished my race. And then so I started asking more questions. I said, how did Paul know he finished his race? Yeah. How do you know when your, your race is done? How, how do you know when it's finished? And, and the Holy Ghost said the reason he knew he finished his race is because it was his race. <laughs> I, I said, wait a minute, oh, one more time. He said, the reason Paul knew he had finished his race is because he was running his race. Mm. The problem with some of us is we're running everybody races but our own. Some of you are running races with no finish line. 
And the reason you're running a race with no finish line is because it ain't your race. Wow. See, some of you have started running races because your mama or your daddy told you that's the race you're supposed to run. Yeah. Some of you are running races because society told you that that's the race you were designed to run. Ah, but the Bible lets me know before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you yeah. and, and I set you apart. I sanctified you. In other yeah. words, God said, I put you on the track you belong on. Yeah. The problem is we ran our race, but we didn't like our race or we saw somebody running a little better than we we're running and we started running their race not because we wanted to go where they're going but we just like the way they run yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Good. paul said i finished the race but what he might as well have been saying is i finished my race yeah. because i ran the race that god put me on yeah. and the race that god put me on may not have been a popular race the race that God put me on may not have been the most safest, secure race. The, the race that God put me on may not have had a whole bunch of money in it. The race that God put me on may not have been the race where it brought me admiration and fame. The, the race that God put me on may not be the race my children want to follow when they grow up, but it's still my race. Somebody say it's still my race. Still my race. Whose race are you running? My and if you're running a race with no finish line, you're just running. Mm. And this is why some of us feel empty because we're just running. Mm. This is why some of us feel unfulfilled because we're just running. This is why some of us wake up with regrets and we don't know where to actually put them to. It's because we're just running. A favorite movie of mine, uh, and, and I don't cry over too many movies, but, but I can't lie because my mama's here and she witnessed it. Uh, a favorite movie of mine is Forrest Gump. I cried on that movie. I did. Don't judge me. But uh, there's a scene in that movie. There's a scene in that movie where Forrest Gump gets up, puts his red hat on, and just goes running. And he starts running. And he keeps running. And he says the plan was to just run to the end of his block. But when he got to the end of his block, he figured he might as well just go out of town. And when he got to the end of town, he was like, well, might as well just run the city. And when he got to the end of the city, he was like, well, might as well just run the state. And when he got to the end of the state, he was like, well, might as well just go ahead and run across the next state. And he just kept running. And he kept running. And, and, and folks started running with him because they wanted to know, Forrest, why are you running? And Forrest just said, I just felt like running. And they just keep joining up because folks are like, are you running for a noble cause? And Forrest said, I just felt like running. And they were like, well, are, are you running to, 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 to get world peace? He was like, hey, I just felt like running. Are, are you running to raise money for a cure for something? Nah, I just felt like running. And Forrest is running and folks are following Forrest and, and, and a whole mob is behind him. And Forrest gets to the middle of nowhere and he stops running. And the folks are confused and they're waiting on him to say something. And Forrest turns around and he says, um, I'm pretty tired. Yeah. I think I'm going to go home. <laughs> and the look of disappointment on these people's faces was amazing because they just knew he was going somewhere. But what they missed wow. was that the finish line was not physical. <laughs> the finish line was in his mind. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. They couldn't see that he reached the end of his race. My God. And if they had been running their own race, My God. they could have appreciated the fact that he may have been in the middle of nowhere. There may not yeah. have been a bunch of cameras around. Yeah. He may not have gotten a whole bunch of money. Yeah, but as long as he reached the place in his mind yeah. that the Lord wanted him, I'm trying to help yeah. somebody today. Yeah. As long as you reach the place yeah. in your life that God has destined yeah. as your finish line but what's most more dangerous than that is to run all of your life and never finish we follow people and we jump in other races because we like how they run but if you knew where I was going to finish you'd stay on your own track see some of y'all want to preach because y'all like how we run yeah. But if you knew what was at our finish line, yeah. if you knew the terrains that we had to run through, yeah. if you knew some of the obstacles that was yeah. on the track that we we're running, yeah. some of y'all want to be famous, but but if you knew where their finish line was, yeah. you, you'd be okay in your little two-bedroom apartment yeah. uh, because at least there's peace on your track. Yeah. There, there's unstableness on theirs. Yeah. 
Uh, some of you, we love to look at other people and we want to run after them because we like how they run. And God is trying to remind somebody that I put you on a specific race. Yes, yes sir. And I need you to finish. Yes. Paul says, when I look back over my life, I, I, I have no regrets because I could have run the race of my mentor. Mm -hmm. And I could have continued to be a Sadducee or a Pharisee. And, and I, I was one of the top ones. And, and I could have kept on persecuting Jews. But, 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 but I'm so glad that God put me back on my race. Yes. <laughs> see, 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 my heritage put me on this race. Yes. See, what was popular put me on this race. Yes. What was profitable put me on this race. Yes. Ah, but the Lord came and knocked me off my donkey one day. Yes. And he says, listen, I got a race for you. And listen, I can't tell you that there's a whole lot of money at the end of this race. I, I can't promise you that all the ladies going to love you when you get to the end of this race. In fact, your own people probably going to throw you away when you get on this race. Ah, but if you get on this race, folks will still be talking about what you said over 2,000 years later. Uh, uh, folks, marriages are going to be saved by your words that you wrote, even though we don't know if you was ever even married. Uh, 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 Christians are going to be better Christians because of the words that you wrote, even though you persecuted Christians. I can't promise you that it'll be an easy road, but but at least you'll finish. Yes, yes sir. But your neighbor said, neighbor, neighbor, are you finishing? Are you finishing? The reason some of us start things and stop them, because we're on the wrong track. Yeah. The, the, the reason no matter how hard you try to make that thing work, it don't seem to work, is because you're running the wrong race. Am I rumbling well? Am I running a quality race? And the last thing, am I retaining my faith? Mm. Am I retaining my faith? Paul says the reason I can look back over my life and my life is amazing is because I rumbled well and, 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 and I ran a quality race. But, but, but the biggest thing is I retained my faith. Paul says I have kept. Somebody say kept. Yeah. He says I have kept the faith. Now the question, of course, I have to ask here is, Paul, how did you keep your faith? Like, how does one actually keep their faith? We live in a world that tries to take our faith from us. We live in a world that tries to suppress our faith. We live in a world that tries to make us feel crazy about our faith. We live in a world that tells us that our faith is racist. Uh, we live in a world that tells us that our faith is hate speech. We live in a world that tells us that our faith is nonsense. How do you keep your faith? And Paul is living at a time where his faith would cost him his head. How do you keep your faith when you're facing that type of persecution? And I had to go back to the original language. What does this word kept mean? And that word kept comes from the Greek word tereo. Somebody say tereo. And that word tereo means to guard or defend. Paul said, I guarded and defended my faith. The reason I can hold on to my faith is because I guarded it. I spent time defending it. I want to ask you a serious question today. When's the last time you had to defend your faith? Yes. See, one of the challenges of this generation is that we like to live in a Christian bubble. We like to surround ourselves with other Christians. We don't even want to work in a place if we don't know at least two or three other Christians that work there. We're scared to go into enemy territory uh, because if we'll be honest, we don't know how to defend our faith. And Peter tells us to always be prepared to give a defense for the hope that you have. But none of us are putting ourselves in a situation to have to defend our faith. See, see, the reason I can hold on to my faith is because I'm willing to ask the why. Yeah. See, I don't just believe in Jesus Christ because my mama believed in Jesus Christ. I don't just believe in Jesus Christ because everybody in my family believes in Jesus Christ. I don't just believe in Jesus Christ because it's popular at the church that I go to. I, I believe in Jesus Christ because I had to defend it. Yeah. I, I, I intentionally asked God the hard questions, even though tradition said you don't ask God questions. I'm so glad I pushed past tradition because when I brought God my hard whys, he gave me some hard answers. And because he gave me hard answers, it solidified my faith. And so I have a foundation that no matter how many winds may blow on my faith, it stands. No matter how many storms rage against my faith, it stands. Why? Because I've been intentional about defending my faith. I see stuff on the news 
things and I ask God why. I see stuff in the school and I ask God why. I see stuff in the church and I ask God why. I see stuff in my family and I ask God why. I see stuff in my marriage and I ask God why. I see stuff with the economy and I ask God why. I see stuff in the community and I ask God why. And I'm so glad that I serve a God who's not intimidated by my questions because when he defends his being, it defends my faith. Amen. How does a pastor go out to a bar with his co-workers? Because it gave me an opportunity to defend my faith. Amen. Why do I go to family reunions with all that ratchet music playing and stuff going on and out the trunk of somebody's car? Because it's an opportunity for me to defend my faith. Uh, why is it that I'm not scared uh, uh, to walk past one of these Hebrew Israelite brothers? Because it's an opportunity to defend my faith. Uh, uh, why is it that I'm not moved when folks come to me with hard questions about Christianity? Because uh, it's an opportunity to defend my faith. See, when I defend my faith, I don't just strengthen their faith. I strengthen my own. Yes, sir. Amen. 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 Paul said, I kept my faith because I was willing to defend my faith. Yes, but, but, but it's not just defending it. That word terreo means maintain. I maintained my faith. So I defended my faith, but I maintained my faith. And to maintain a thing means to keep it in good health. So he said, the reason I kept my faith is because I kept my faith healthy. OK, y'all are missing it. Uh, 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 there, there was this little girl whose father came home one day and he bought her a puppy and she was excited about the puppy. She went around town telling everybody, I got this new puppy. This puppy is so amazing. She told all of her friends, I got this puppy and this puppy is amazing. She was all on social media taking pictures and selfies with her puppy. She loved this puppy with everything that was in her. She would wake up every day and just brag about this amazing puppy and play with this puppy. And do all sorts of things with the puppy. But one day the puppy started trying to run away. And she couldn't figure it out. And so she would catch the puppy and, and take it back to her room. And she would go to sleep. She would wake up. The puppy was trying to escape. She would get him back. And she would you know, keep on going about her business. The puppy would just keep trying to get away. And finally she went to her father and said, Daddy, I don't know what's gotten into this puppy. But he keeps trying to run away from me. And the father walked over to the puppy's feeding dish. And notice no, no food in it. And he said, baby, when the last time you fed this puppy? She said, I didn't know I had to feed it. <laughs> Some of y'all got saved. And you were just excited to be saved. Mm. On, but you never fed it. Right. And this brings me to my next point. Your faith is fleeting because your faith ain't eating. <laughs> your faith is fleeting because your faith ain't eating. See, 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 the reason uh, before I was a pastor or a preacher, I would show up at Bible study because I wasn't just excited to be saved. I was willing to maintain my salvation. Yes, sir. The reason I would show up at prayer meetings, even though I didn't always have a prayer life, is because I knew I had to feed that thing. The reason I would follow this man, it seemed like he had a preaching engagement every week on top of the regular Sunday morning <laughs> services we used to have. It is because I knew my faith yeah. had to eat something. Yeah. And, and what's messing this generation up is we've gotten so comfortable with just being saved. We're so excited about just being saved that we forgot that beyond the excitement, beyond just having something to brag about, beyond the blessings of the Lord making us rich and adding no sorrow, that I got to feed the faith yeah. that I have. Are you feeding your faith? Are you finding intentional opportunities to feed the thing that's getting you through? See, the reason I don't break down when stuff seems to be falling down all around me yeah. is because I spend enough time feeding my faith. And when you feed your faith, watch this, your faith will fuel you. When you feed your faith during good times, your faith will fuel you through the bad times. Mm -hmm. And the reason some of us don't know whether we're coming or going when hard times hit us is because our faith tank is on E. We're not being intentional about putting ourselves in atmospheres mm -hmm. and even just putting ourselves in atmospheres, creating an atmosphere at our home yeah, yeah. where our faith can eat. Paul said, I can keep my faith even though I don't know if I'm going to make it out of here. I can still hold my faith 
because I've maintained my faith. And because I've maintained my faith, even though my head may be about to get cut off, I know my faith will maintain me. The key to living a good life is doing what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let a man examine himself. Stop spending time examining everybody else's race and examine your own. Because here's the thing. If you run your race well, you'll be just like Forrest Gump. Folks will want to run just because they see you running. Mm -hmm. They won't know where you're going, but they'll just know they want to run. Somebody say, run, Forrest, run. Run, run, Forrest, run. I'm running because I know my finish line. I didn't always know my finish line, but I know my finish line. And because I know my finish line, I'm determined to run my race well. And I've come to the conclusion that when you rumble well, when you run a quality race and you retain your faith, I believe verse eight becomes true for us. That this type of life gets rewarded. Paul says there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all somebody say all. Oh. To all those who have loved his appearing. I love that last part. See, some of us think we're going to get a crown because we lived right. No, no, no. That's not what he says the criteria is. Some of us think we're going to get a crown because we had perfect attendance at church. And no, that's that's not what Paul says the criteria is. He says the person who's going to get the crown is the person who loved his appearing. Ah, don't miss this. Don't miss this. He doesn't say you were perfect. He doesn't say you did everything right. He doesn't say you gave the biggest offering. He said the one who loved his appearing. What does it mean to love his appearing? I love when God shows up. Watch this. So in the middle of a fight, I can keep my tongue because I want God to show up. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. I don't have to be right all the time. I'm willing to take a loss so that instead of being right, I can be righteous yes. I, because I love his appearing. How much do you love his appearing? And do you love his appearing more than you love your appearance? Yes, sir. And one of the challenges of us is we love our appearance more than we love his appearing. I would rather walk away from the situation feeling right yeah. than being righteous. There's a lot of arguments I have bowed out of, not because I was wrong, but I just preferred to be righteous in the situation. Amen. I've come to the conclusion that some people fight so much because that's the only win they can look forward to. Right. And I value my wins enough to say, you know what? You got it, boo. <laughs> if, if, if you got to give all this energy uh, 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 over two dollars, you got it, boo. <laughs> if, if you got to give all this energy over something you don't have the research to back up, but you read on the Internet, you got it. <laughs> if you're going to give all this energy about a God you don't even believe in. You got it, boo. <laughs> I refuse to keep giving bad energy to good fights Man. because I've come to the conclusion that because I love his appearing so much, watch this, the word of God becomes true. This battle is not mine. Mm -hmm. It's the Lord's. Amen. See, I used to watch this thing called wrestling back in the day. Uh, it wasn't real, but it was entertaining. And, 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 and there was a particular type of match that was interesting. Uh, uh, in this fight, it would be two against two. And they would always, it never failed, it would always at some point of the fight, uh, this person would just be getting stomped out. I mean, it would be bad. They would just get beat on. They would never let him get back to his corner. They'd be, you know, beating him up in their corner. He just could not get away. But finally, he would just muster up the strength out of nowhere. And he would crawl back 
to his corner and, and he wouldn't make it all the way. And then the person would maybe grab their leg or something, but they would still keep crawling, trying to get to their corner. And with the last bit of energy they had, they would just jump up and tag in their partner. I'm to a place in my life that certain fights, if I'm getting dogged out in, I'm just going to use all my energy to get to my secret closet because I'm going to tag God in. I wish somebody would leave out of here with a commitment that there are certain fights that I'm not going to waste all my energy. I'm not going to waste all my emotion. I'm not going to waste all my mental capacity. God, this is too much for me. So I'm going to tag you in. Why? Because when I tag you in, it's a sign that I love your appearing. It's a sign that you are mightier than I am. It's a sign that you can fight this better than I can. It's a sign that your words are better than mine. It's a sign that you are an undefeated God and I am a defeated foe. So God, I'm going to tag you in. Yes, sir. Because I love your appearance. Amen, amen. I'd rather tag you into a situation than for me to remain tangled in the situation. Mm. And because I'm willing to tag God in, because I'm willing to not feel like I have to fight all my battles, because I'm willing to let his appearance come through over my own. He says, there's a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give me on that day. There's somebody who's on a race today and you're wondering why is it that, you know, it's, it's so lonely on this road? Why is it that it seems like I can't get ahead financially? Why is it that it seems like everybody got a boo but me? Why is it that it seems like I give so much on this race and it seems like no one's giving back to me in this race? I got good news for you. Mm -hmm. That if you're on that type of race, you may not see the reward here. Mm -hmm. But there's a, somebody says there's a time coming. There's a time coming. There's a time coming. This, this is what I love so much. There's a time coming where the Bible says, the Lord, the righteous judge, will give it to you himself. I want you to think about that. Jesus has prepared a crown for you. Some of you have gone your whole life feeling like a peasant and God himself is going to take a crown and he's going to place it on your head. Mm. Ah, some of you are waiting for people to crown you whose crowns ain't worth nothing. <laughs> some of y'all are, are willing to accept some rusted crowns. When God says, I've reserved a righteous crown for you. And don't sell yourself short for a temporary fix down here. When I've prepared so much, just keep running the race. Keep fighting the battle. Hold on to your faith. And if you can do that, then the day that comes when someone stands up at your funeral and say he fought the good fight or she fought the good fight. They ran a good race. They finished it. They kept their faith that they won't just be saying something because they don't have anything to say, but they'll be speaking from the true experience that they've seen in your life, mm -hmm. that they saw how beautiful your fights were that they saw that you finished what you started because what you started is what God started for you and that you held on to your faith when everything around you said curse God and die when everything around you said throw in the towel when everything around you said don't go to church no more when everything around you said put that Bible down and everything around you said God don't hear your prayers because you persevered mm. God himself Hallelujah. will put a crown on you, and I'd rather be crowned by him in glory yes, than to receive some of the crowns yes, that this world would want to give me. Yes. Because I've come to, to the realization that a crown down yes. here sometimes costs more than I'm willing to pay. Yes. A crown down here may cost me my integrity. A crown down here may cost me my sexuality. A crown down here may cost me my manhood. A crown down here may cost me my family. A crown down here may cost me respect in my community. But when God gives the Bible says the blessings of the Lord make rich and add no sorrow. Mm. So I'd rather wait for his than to settle for this world.